classes. Um, and I suspect they will continue to join as we go through the evening. But so in case you are for another course, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Patrick Plummer, and I'm the professor of uh, uh, 531. And I'm joined by Kate Ward uh, Speaks, who is TSS, and Dana Mather, who is also uh, Austin TSS. So it's nice to have everybody. Um, but tonight, uh, really, I am extraordinarily pleased to introduce Stephanie Stuckey, who is the CEO of Stuckey's Corporation. Um, if you don't know Stuckey's, you are missing out something fantastic. <laughs> um, let me tell you, uh, uh, Stuckey's is a, I'm sure somebody's going to you know, share with you a, a bit about the history, but Stuckey's is an 85-year-old company, and at its peak, it had about 400 stores in over 30 states. Did I have that right, right Stephanie? Close. Uh, 368 stores in 40 states. In 40 states. Oh, that's okay. Oh, awesome. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, when I, I have a personal interest, and I was super excited to have <laughs> Stephanie agree to this, um, because it, I have a personal relationship with Stucky, at least I feel that I do. Uh, and when I was a kid, my father was a school teacher. And during the summers, we had the summers off and we would travel. Uh, we had a travel trailer and we would drive down to Florida. Uh, my aunt had a house there. We were able to stay at the house. And along the way, we would stop at Stuckey's. This is where they, these, this teal blue roof that you would see uh, would emerge uh, with the gas stations. And it was Texaco, Texaco gas. And uh, it, it was a, just a, it was a magical place. And I'm not just saying that casually. To me as a kid, this was just a magical place. It had all these, you know, uh, uh, little uh, um, knickknacks that you could buy and go through and they're, 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 uh, um, the entrances, it was always clean. The restrooms were always back in the left-hand corner uh, of, the, of the place. There was a little restaurant in the back. They had, you know, oftentimes samples. If you fill up your gas, you got a little cinnamon rolls for free. You got three little cinnamon rolls for free. It was a wonderful, it was a wonderful place. And as a kid, truly, I have many of my favorite memories in life in relationship to a Stuckey's. In fact, you know, at Penn State, the, one of the things that I love about Penn State is the magic that there is about Penn State. You go up to World Camp, you go up to Main Campus, and I don't know what's in the Kool-Aid, but there's just so much energy, there's so much electricity. Um, it, it, if you've ever been up Main Campus, you know what I'm talking about. When I was in getting my doctorate, I actually wrote a paper about corporations that could introduce magic to hmm. the experience. And I actually mentioned Stuckey's <laughs> as, as part of that. In fact, I even have a little Stuckey's magnet that goes <laughs> on my refrigerator. So uh, this is, a, it, it's an awesome place. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've seen the blue teal roofs become fewer and fewer in between. In fact, I'll drive by sometimes and I'll see one that's been closed. I'll be like, oh, there's a Stuckey's. Uh, there's an old Stuckey's that, that's now closed. Um, so uh, um, Stephanie has now taken over, retaken over the ownership. Uh, of Stuckey's after it was sold um, and got into a, a bit of disrepair, um, dis disarray. And now she's at the helm and she's in Georgia now in a farmhouse driving <laughs> the business again. And so, you know, I thought it was really interesting uh, and important to have, uh, um, wonderful that, that Stephanie would agree to, because, you know, last week we, we heard from YouTube and Stuckey's. The, the reality is there's very few I mean, corporations. Google. Google. What did I say? Google. Yeah. What did I say? What I say, YouTube, YouTube and Stuckies. I think they're going to merge. I think I think there's an acquisition. Right? I think Stuckies about ready to acquire YouTube, so it, it's yes. their way to get their market. <laughs> um, you know, we, we heard that there's very few companies like that. Um, the reality is just based on the number um, of small businesses, smaller businesses that are hardworking. That you know, there's much more likelihood that a lot of students are going to end up at working at it within a Stuckies model, a Stuckies type of a model. Um, it's a wonderful one where they have a strong brand, uh, and it's interesting to kind of to see the progression of how they are going to innovate, leverage their existing relationships. And when I did the research, I thought I'm not alone at magic. I was, you know, I thought I kind of it was my own little thing, but it's that, that's clearly a, a, a magical aspect of Stucky. So now there's a lot of folks that are rooting for, her. and um, with that, I'm going to simply uh, turn this over. And as you think of questions. Keep them back in your mind, write them down. You can either um, uh, uh, chat them, uh, send via chat to um, Kate, 
or at the end, like we did, uh, uh, we can simply raise your hand and we'll kind of, Stephanie's been kind enough to agree to do some Q&A afterwards. And with that, Stephanie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank you, Patrick. What a what a pleasure. That was just one of the best introductions I've ever heard. I The personal connection with that brand is the reason why I am on this absolutely crazy journey to revive my family's brand. So I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, and I really want uh, conversation. So think about questions or even better, I actually prefer comments and feedback because sometimes I think you get more interesting dialogue that way. So just think of whatever's on your mind. Uh, this is no holes barred. Stuckey's I think has an advantage in that we are a very small company. We have had a big past, so we're not your recognition, especially with, frankly, a certain era. We are scrappy. I joke that we are an 85-year-old startup, and we are most definitely in this innovation mode. I think one of the most important things I want to stress is that, like you said in your introduction, innovation is not just the Googles and the YouTubes of the world. It's not always an app or a new flat screen or some sort of innovative technology. It can be as basic as how you lay out a store. You talked about how the bathrooms were always in the far left. And I love that you remember that because that was innovation. My grandfather who started Stuckey's in 1937 during the great depression with no money, he had a $35 loan from his grandmother to buy pecans. It was a bumper crop year for pecans and he was selling them on the side of the road for a modest profit. And he did well enough to start a small store. And he really had the first roadside retail store that became a roadside chain. He was the first, Stuckey's was the first to offer gas, cold drinks, a quick hot snack, some candies, that he made himself. And we were also known for a lot of kitschy fun souvenirs, but we were really the first. We were before TA and Pilot, Truck Stops of America, Bucky's, all of those. We were 1937, we were the first. He had no formal education other than the high school. He had to drop out of college because they couldn't afford it. So everything he did was innovating and Innovation is really having passion and trying a lot of different things and failing, accepting failure and being able to pivot, adjust, adapt and move on and continually refining. So to getting to the, where the bathrooms were and the stores, that was innovation. He tried various layouts for his stores and he figured out how to maximize sales. And it was making customers walk through the entire store. And it was almost like a scavenger hunt, the way he designed his stores and the display. So customers would have to walk through to get to the bathroom. Because when you're driving on the road, what's one of the first things you want when you pull over? You want to go to the restroom. Well, he didn't make the restroom right at the door because he wanted you to go through and see all his product on the way to the restroom. He knew that was the way to guarantee maximum visibility. So just things like that can be innovative. It doesn't have to be an app. So we are not your typical company because we fell out of family hands for decades. Most family brands you see like third generation, it's you know, everyone is sort of geared and groomed throughout the process to one day become head of the family business. But that was not my journey. The company was sold a year before I was born. Then it was bought by another company. And, after, you know, we had a series of takeovers. We lost hundreds of stores. We lost brand value. We were, we were not operating at a profit. We never went bankrupt, though. But we were relegated to status of whatever happened to if you did a Google search for Stuckey's. My father got the company back, 
but he was running several other businesses at the time. So he propped Stuckey's up by attaching it to Dairy Queen stores on the interstate highway system because my dad had the franchise rights to Interstate Dairy Queen Corporation. And so he would pair Stuckey's with Dairy Queen. And that model worked. It kept Stuckey's afloat. Fast forward 30 years, he sold Dairy Queen to Warren Buffett because Warren Buffett owns American Dairy Queen. So my dad and all his business partners retired and the infrastructure that had largely supported Stuckey's around this Dairy Queen business, that shuttered too. And there was only a skeleton crew running Stuckey's for the past decade. And the company had been losing money for five years when they approached me and asked me if I wanted to buy the company. So I actually bought my family's business. I did not inherit it. And I put my life savings into it at age 53, having no business background. And um, I'm an attorney. I was a state representative for 14 years. And I was head of sustainability for the city of Atlanta after that. And I did environmental law. So I, I, I have skills, but they weren't necessarily business related. What I think it's important to stress, if no matter what field you go into, and hopefully some of you will become business leaders and entrepreneurs, is you have to have passion for whatever it is you do. And when I made the decision to buy Stuckey's, I consulted several financial advisors. I consulted three. Two said, don't do it. The third said, do it. The reason I listened to the third is the third saw something that wasn't on the balance sheets and he saw the value of the brand. And I think it's really important to connect with whatever it is you're doing and making sure that it's not just about making money. That's what the first two financial advisors were looking at. They were looking at, is this a profitable company in financial terms? They weren't looking at, is this company bringing value innovation is. It's solving problems that people have. And it's creating magic. It's creating an emotional connection and it's building community. And that's what Stuckey's has done for so long. And I knew that Stuckey's was capable of that because I knew my grandfather. I was blessed to have known him. I was 12 when he died. And I road trip like everyone else. I remember the company, the first decade after it was sold, it was still doing well. And so I was road tripping and stopping at Stuckey's like everyone else. And I knew that there was still a community out there, people who love to road trip. And frankly, I think there is a need because when you road trip, there aren't these special places on the interstate like there used to be where you can really connect with the fun and the adventure of seeing America by car or by motorcycle. Or frankly, lately we've been sponsoring some bike races. So people explore America by bike as well. And so I felt that there was this, there was this need still out there. And one of the, I remember one of the things uh, someone asked me when I made this decision, they said, well, Stephanie, you've never even run the lemonade stand. What makes you think you can run Stuckey's? And I said, well, I don't think I can run a lemonade stand, but I can run Stuckey's because I have a passion for it. So that's what I would stress more importantly than anything is in order to be truly innovative, you've got to have that passion because if you don't have the passion as you're trying and failing and trying and failing and trying and failing, which is what innovation is all about. If you don't have the drive for what you're doing, it's never going to work. I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave you with an example and then I want to get some questions, but um, someone I really admire. Have you all heard of Tope? Wait, Autona. Tope. He invented Calendy. So you may use Calendy. He's in Atlanta. I would love to meet him. That's where I live. And I do a wonderful interview with him in the podcast, How I Built This, with Guy Raz. He talked about how initially Tope wanted to just make money. He, he was an innovator. He was an entrepreneur, but he wanted to make money. So his first venture was he was selling movie projectors online. Well, he knew nothing about movie projectors, but he'd done this algorithm that said that a lot of people did searches online for movie projectors. So he knew there was a need that people had. So he was solving a problem. 
So that's the first part of innovation. You're solving a problem that people have and you're filling it. So he was selling movie projectors, but he didn't have a passion for it. And he realized after he set up this whole website, he sunk a ton of money into creating this website and selling these projectors that people really wanted to have this community around movie projectors. And they were asking him all these questions and they were wanting to talk, you know, geek out about movie projectors. And he didn't know anything about movie projectors. He was like, I'm just trying to make a dollar. So he failed miserably at it, even though he was solving a problem and there was a real need out there because he didn't have the passion. So the next thing he tried was selling uh, basically like the big green egg because he saw, again, there was a need. People wanted to be able in rural communities, you couldn't get access to the big green egg at, the, at this time. You could get it in big cities. So he's like created this website to do, to sell the big green egg. But again, people wanted to create a community around barbecuing and grilling and being in the outdoors. And he wasn't into that. So it failed again. So then he said, you know what? I'm just going to take a break. I'm just going to work my job and I'm just going to clear my mind. And then he, while he was working his job, he saw the need to be more efficient at how you schedule meetings. And so he started tinkering with the idea to create Calendly. And if you've used it, I use it. It's an amazing uh, software and it enables you to share your calendar with other people and conveniently and easily calendar and he became obsessed with it he was passionate about it he saved up some more money he invested in it he um he went from nothing investing his life savings it cost him two hundred fifty thousand dollars to start this company and is now he's his sales are now in the hundreds of millions and he's got 15 million uh subscribers and the difference between that and the first two ventures is that he was passionate. So I think whatever it is that you do, you really have to have a passion for it. And I have a passion for not just my family's business because I have that emotional connection, but I really love road tripping. And people email me all the time and post comments about their favorite places to visit when they go traveling. And I love it. Like those are my people and I'm building this community around it. So. It's so much bigger than just selling a product. And by the way, we did. We bought a candy plant and we bought a pecan shelling plant. A year after I bought the company, I got the financing to do that. So that's how we're driving revenue. But more importantly than driving revenue, we're building a community and we're creating an emotional connection and a magic around what we do. So I encourage you, whatever it is that you do, think about why you really want to do this. Do I have a passion for it? And am I building a community around it? That to me is, is what it's all about. And I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to talk about innovation. Uh, you know, it's kind of challenging when you're innovating an 85 year old company, but I think it's just as worthwhile. And too often we just think of innovation as related to, you know, these devices, but there's lots of ways you can innovate in the food space in the travel space in the retail space. And that's what I'm doing. And it's right at 20 minutes. So perfect. <laughs> Very excited to have you here. If you don't guys consider following Stephanie on LinkedIn, she is not um, uh, normally at home. She is usually in small towns somewhere posting yeah. great comments on what is happening out in the universe. And um, uh, let's see, Patrick, I see your hand is up. You want to ask a question? I, I appreciate it, Stephanie, and uh, I'll geek out a little bit, just like uh, our, our professor there. So uh, Stucky's 1937 Del Marva Peninsula off of Highway 13 has a kid headed down to go across the, the uh, Bay Bridge Tunnel down in Chesapeake. Always a stop, always a time. Thank you. Always a feeling. So, so thank, thank you for uh, your your uh, heritage uh, to, to, to do something like that and actually have a positive effect in a, in a large, communi or large community. So um, something that I've been learning in this class is that uh, transformal, uh, transformational innovation goes beyond breakthrough products, including business model innovation. So you, you kind of alluded to it and I don't want you to break any confidence in, 
confidences, obviously, or anything like that. But what are you doing with 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 this particular company to create um, new ways to create, deliver, and capture value? To create, deliver, and capture value? Value, yes. Yeah. So I think one of the most challenging things for me, and I think this is true of other nostalgic or legacy brands, is that you built your company or your predecessors built the company a certain way. And then in order to evolve and remain relevant and remain profitable, you have to change. And so it's this balance of how am I true to our roots, but at the same time, I'm making sure that we're moving forward. So for us, the biggest challenge for value, and I'm talking about monetary value, and I'll get to the other value of emotional, nostalgic, and brand value, but the monetary value is critical because if if you're not earning revenue, you have to fold up shop. And so the hardest thing for me was I had to let go of my preconceived notion of how I was going to rebuild this brand. When I came into Stuckey's, I, uh, first thing I did, I'm a planner, right? I, I'm a lawyer. I worked for government. You know, we're, we're really good at drafting plans. So I did the strategic plan and I had to throw it out within about six months. And my strategic plan was based on how Stuckey's had become a brand. And that was we had these stores all along the interstate highway system. As Patrick said, we had, we had 368 stores in 40 states. Well, the reality is when I bought the company, we didn't own or operate. We don't own or operate any stores. There are only 20 standalone stuckies left. They're all independently owned and operated under a licensing deal. And then we have 45 other locations that are like a store within a store concept. And then we had a couple of hundred retail stores that just simply sold our product. And so that was the reality of the situation. So initially I was like, okay, well, we are going to own a store and then we're going to own another store. And then we're going to start, you know, doing just like my grandfather. We're going to a little bit more expensive since the 1940s, 50s, 60s, when my grandfather was building his stores. So it cost anywhere from, depending on the size and the scale, one to six million to build a travel plaza on the interstate. When you're talking about six acres plus of land for a large, you know, 20,000 square feet and up building, uh, it's just cost prohibitive. We didn't have that financing. And I looked at how we were actually driving revenue for this company. And it was the sell of our product. So I had to pivot and I had to realize that to make this company profitable, it was selling the product. So how do you make a company profitable selling product? There's two ways. You reduce the cost on the front end and then you sell more on the back end. So to reduce cost, we had to quit outsourcing. We had to buy a candy plant. We had to buy a pecan shelling plant and we got financing through the small business association. Huge. I'm a huge fan of if you can do it, getting your own financing and not getting venture capital, not getting private equity because they will control you. They will control your brand. They will tell you what to do and they will be in charge. If you're okay with completely handing over everything that you do to them, then go for it. But if you have the credit and you get access to it, get financing. And if you have the appetite for it, you have to be okay with your house being mortgaged. So I had a business, I got a business partner and he and I jointly bought this candy plant, bought this manufacturing facility. We're now making our own product. And then we rapidly expanded the sales of our product. We went online, we've got a robust online presence, and we went from about 300 locations that are selling our product to over 3,000. And so you have to pivot. You have to look at the reality. How are you actually making money? So that's how you drive. That's how we're driving value is the sale of the product. That doesn't mean I can't be true to what our brand is about. I can still talk all day long 
about the road trip. And that's the beauty of the internet and social media and storytelling. And I'm telling the truth, we're a road trip brand. We got 85 years of being a road trip brand, but we don't necessarily have to have a brick and mortar store that we own and operate to be a road trip brand. So it's, it's been a lot of innovating and evolving, but uh, it's working. And we've gone from six figures in debt to six figures profit, and we still have a long, long way to go, but it's working. I hope that answered your question. Oh, very much so. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I've got a question here that I've gotten in message um, and I will pass along to you. So you've talked quite a bit about the innovations that have happened. What soft skills and potentially hard skills, I'll add in my own ask there, um, have you tapped within yourself that kind of surprised you on, on your journey being an innovator and a leader in terms of your leadership, soft skills, interpersonal skills, and, and even just capacity? I think emotional intelligence is the most important. And if you listen to any talks with Warren Buffett, he talks about that all the time, which I find really fascinating because he's known as one of the most successful financial investors of all time. And you would think he would be very focused on simply the numbers, but in interviews, he repeatedly hones in on when he's looking for companies that he's going to invest in. There's a couple of things he looks at, and one of them is the emotional intelligence of his leadership. And the other thing is he looks at investing for the long haul. And I so love that. I mean, not only because I'm, an, I'm running a nostalgic brand, but I think if you are playing the long game and not the short game, you're going to have lasting value. If you're just looking to turn a profit, and sell your company in three to five years, that doesn't interest me. Uh, and that, if that's what you want to do, that's great. That's why I'm not a big fan of private equity. Most of the firms I talk to are looking for a three to five year return on investment and then they're checking out. That's not us. We're, we're the long-term investment. And if you're a long-term investment, it gets to another soft skill where you're not easily phased. Things can go wrong and they go wrong all the time. And you're like, okay, I'm an 85 year old company. We've survived the Great Depression. We survived World War II gas and sugar rationing. We survived the Arab oil embargo. We survived the interstate highway system being built and bypassing all of our stores. And we had to move our entire company to the interstate. We survived the not one, but two corporate takeovers. We survived almost going bankrupt, which is right before I bought the company. So, all right, we had a packaging snafu, which I posted about today in LinkedIn. We had a pretty bad setback with packaging that was defective. And we had to recall all of our brand new product line, which sucked. But yeah, <laughs> it's in my post today. It took me like two weeks to have the courage to tell that story, but I want to tell that story because I want to put out there that some days just suck and it's not easy running a scrappy startup. There are some really hard days and too often we just talk about the successes, but the failures are what really causes the growth and the learning and the moving forward. So that gets to another soft skill is just the capacity to accept failures as necessary. It's part of the process. It's not fun, but if you don't have failure, you're never going to learn. I, I mean, I think probably over half of what I do is interpersonal skills. I'm, I'm down here in Eastman, Georgia, which is where we have our distribution center. And I've spent a good part of my day, not only working on logistics, but working on interpersonal relations with the different warehouse staff that aren't getting along with one another. You've got to be empathetic. You've got to listen and you've got to uh, give people a sense of belonging and purpose that's well beyond just working their job. Otherwise, 
your team isn't going to stay. And I'm very proud to say that we have not had a single person quit since I bought the company. We've had one person retire who was slated to retire already, and that's it. And, and that's with taking over another company. We kept all of their team in place. So I'm a big believer in getting a team together and making them happy and building them and growing together and staying intact. That's really impressive. And, and I, I, I will fangirl on your transparency and, <laughs> and your honesty on LinkedIn. Honestly, guys, if you're not following or you're missing out and it's a great story to watch. Um, Jacob, you had your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you for the taking the time. And Hi. actually you had a perfect segue into my question, um, yeah. which was, if you could um, pinpoint like some of the things you do to, even though you're an innovator, things that you do to encourage among your innovation, like among the ranks at different levels. And if you have any specific strategies that you use to enable or encourage people to share their ideas and be entrepreneurs or innovators themselves. That is such a great question. I think the most important thing a CEO or leader can do to foster innovation among a team is just to let people know it's okay to fail. You give them a safe environment where if they fail, you're, nobody's going to chastise them. Nobody's going to be looking over their shoulder. Uh, I'm... I'm not, I, yes, you have to, I was going to say I'm not a big believer in metrics, so I just said it. I think it is important to measure. Obviously, you got to know how people are performing, but I don't want people to be so hell-bent on, I've got to perform, I've got to hit these metrics to the point that they're afraid of failing. They're afraid of, of trying things. And so I think it's really important just to say, let's try it. Let's try it. And you structure these experiments in a way that if it doesn't work, it'll be all right. You know, not everything's going to fall apart. And uh, we, we like, for example, we just hired a new warehouse manager because the previous warehouse manager retired. That was a one person who's left. So new warehouse manager came in January this year. And Initially, he was always asking me questions like, can I do this? Can I do that? And I kept telling him, you're in charge of the warehouse. You make all those decisions. I am not going to micromanage you. I am here to support you and give you the tools you need to succeed. You tell me what you need and I will get it for you. Like he said, we need a new forklift. Done. And I'm like, all right, you need forklift training for the team. It's like, oh yeah, we got to do that. So let's train up the team and build their skill set so that they're more confident. Um, so I'm just constantly trying to make sure that the team has what they need and that they know they can always come to me. I think sometimes uh, people are afraid to come to the CEO or the leader with suggestions. So it's really important to ask. So that is one thing I'm always doing is, what do you think we should be doing? What do you think? I think those are the most important words you can ask before and ask it before I give my opinion. Because I think too often if I say, okay, well, I think we should do this. What do you think? Well, the team's probably going to nod their head. So don't do it that way. If you're in charge, you put your problem out there and say, even though I may have the solution in mind, you need to listen feel free to say what they want to say. And then who knows, you might, you might actually have a good idea there and you would have squelched it if you would just put your opinion there. You know, what's that? Um, I'm going to get Simon Sinek's second book wrong. It's like leaders eat last or leader, leaders speak last. You speak last. You hear what they have to say first. So you're really fostering that um, confidence that you really truly care what the team wants to do and what their ideas are. Thank you so much. John, you're next. Stephanie, thank you for um, joining us tonight. And I, I, hearing the, the setup of your business makes me wonder, how do you, you, you 
You survived the interstate highway system. You survived the gas prices in the seventies. Uh, now with all car companies and, and uh, transportation companies saying that they're going electric in the next 15 to 20 years, that all their cars are going to be electrified. How do you future proof uh, your your company to make sure that you can still give stuff to an electric car for transportation? And well, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Actually, my background, which I hinted at was I was head of sustainability for the city of Atlanta and I started the city's electric vehicle program. So I'm all for electrification of our transportation system. And in fact, I drive an electric car and a hybrid car, I have two cars. And uh, the reality, unfortunately, though, is it's only 4% of the market now. I do think it's rapidly changing. There's incredible opportunity in the electric vehicle space for roadside retail stores. <clears throat> and it's actually there more than you would think. And more so for someone like Stuckey's that's nimble. And here's why, it's really interesting. I'm in the room now with the CEOs of these big corporations, Pilot and TA and the others. Even though we're a small player, I get to go to some of these events and I hear them talk and they are so heavily invested in petroleum. It's insane. They enter into these long-term contracts with their gas jobbers. They have invested serious money in the gas infrastructure of their stores. And so they're not enthusiastically embracing electric vehicles by and large, like there's a handful here and there out, but they're outliers. It's phenomenal. Their business model is based not just on selling gas, but selling diesel in a lot of cases, because they want the trucks, right? And the trucks are going to be the slower ones to electrify. It's just harder, um, even though Tesla is working on it. So I think part of it is like, when you're talking about innovation, and I'm interested in your feedback, I think it's actually a lot easier to innovate if you're like a Stuckey's than if you're a Google. We're more nimble. Uh, I think Stuckey's is easier to, to innovate than Pilot or Truck Stops of America because they are so entrenched. They've got thousands of stores and thousands of employees and they're all invested heavily in gas. Whereas we can come along like, we'll put up an EV charger. No problem. We're not, it's a lot easier for us. We don't have that. We don't have those long-term relationships. Even though we've been around a long time, our stores have, have um, seen hard times. So we're in the process of innovating with how we move forward with our store concept. The other thing is when you charge, even if it's innovating, and, and I have a Tesla, I've used Tesla, <laughs> but it, it charges fast, but it's still going to take 30 to 60 minutes to fully charge my Tesla. So you're going to be sitting at a store spending money, hopefully. So there's a huge market opportunity there if you can get people to come to your store. So the whole idea is to figure out how are ways that you can be a differentiator, get people to come to your place as opposed to a Bucky's. And I really, really study what gets people to pull over. I go to all the uh, co so-called competitors, but to me, it's less about competing with them than it is figuring out what makes us different and how we can win over the customer more than how we're going to compete with, say, Cracker Barrel. And I think there still is a need for some magic when you're traveling by road. I still think that there is a need for an experience that they're largely lacking. Most places don't offer dog parks. A lot of people travel with their pets. Very few places offer electric vehicles. Very few places offer decent coffee and decent food that's not fast food junk. So I see a lot, a lot of innovation opportunities there and I'm excited about it. The other thing that gives us a differentiator unlike any of the other places is that we have a product that we sell that we are known for. We're known for our candies, we're known for the pecan log roll and we can sell that product in thousands of stores. Like I said, we've gone from 300 stores to over 3000 that are selling Stucky's pecan log roll, Stucky's praline, Stucky's divinity, Stucky's fudge, and so we're diversifying how we are making our revenue. 
So if the candy doesn't do well, we've got our healthy pecans. If the roadside retail is not doing good, well, we sell kitschy souvenirs and we've got these licensed locations. So um, we've got a variety of ways that we are becoming profitable and we are profitable. So the more we diversify, the more we're future-proofing if one of these areas doesn't pan out. Thank it's you. very exciting to watch. I'm still a little all over the place. I hope I answered your question. You <laughs> Cecilia, your hands up. Hi, yeah, thanks, Stephanie, for, for your time. Hopefully you can hear me. I switched my headset. I um, can. Okay, perfect. So I was curious to see as a, a female CEO, how do you ride the line between being perhaps perceived as aggressive and forceful but then on the other side, being uh, like too nice, too collaborative and getting kind of pushed over. I was curious to see if you have any tactics or perspectives that you found that have been particularly valuable and effectively leading your team. Great question. And I will say this has been forged over decades of being in positions of leadership, starting with getting elected to the Georgia legislature when I was 32 years old. At that time, the Georgia General Assembly was 20% female. And so I definitely was very much in the minority. I got called honey and sweetie and everything you can imagine. And I initially felt like I had to armor up and be very forceful and assertive and strong in order to deal with that. And then I finally just decided you have to embrace who you are. And that's not me. I just tend to be a consensus builder. I like to think of myself as a nice person and maybe it is perceived sometimes as being a little bit of a pushover, but I would much rather be authentically who I am than try to be something I'm not. What I have done is I've learned that you cannot do it alone. I have studied a lot of CEOs that I admire, male, female, black, white, everything in between. And I found the one consistent characteristic that they all share, very, very different personality types. But the one thing that the CEOs of corporations that are successful share is that they, they complement their skill sets with team members who balance them out. And so I tend to be big visionary type. I surround myself with people who are very detail oriented. I tend to be impulsive and say, yes, I surround myself with naysayers who are hesitant. It's a really good balance. And so you just kind of let them, you know, you, you just work it out. And so I would just say, bring your authentic self to the table and, use being a woman as a superpower. I think we have so many skill sets. We are more, I don't want to completely generalize, but I do think that women are empathetic. I think we tend to be collaborative and consensus builders. And I see that as a strength and pair yourself with someone who might be more of a hard nosed negotiator, but don't try to be something you're not. And that doesn't mean you don't try to hone skill sets that you lack because you always want to try to continually improve, but hone in and hunker down on what is you and what you're good at. The other thing, the last thing I'll say about being a, a woman is I think we have an obligation if you are at the table and you look around and you're the only woman or you're the only African-American or you're the only whatever minority you happen to be to speak up and say, we need more people at the table. And I kind of had a breakdown the other day at this meeting where we were talking about doing a partnership with a major corporation that y'all would have heard of. It's an ice cream company. And they're like, oh, we need them to do a Stucky's praline pecan ice cream. And I know so-and-so and I can get us in with them. And I said, well, I've been talking with this small ice cream firm. It's run by an African-American female chef. And I really want to collab with her. And they're like, well, she doesn't have the distribution. She doesn't have the name recognition. She doesn't have this and that. And I'm like, I'm tired of us working with these big, you know, why do we have to be with yet another firm that's yet another white male? And, you know, the entire meeting was a bunch of white guys. I love you, white guys. My dad's a white guy. My 
son's a white guy, my former husband's a white male, so I love white men, but we need more voices at the table. We have to speak up. And I just said, that's it. You know, we don't have to go with this big firm. Why don't we help out this African-American female chef who happens to make the most delicious ice cream I've ever had and help her and together we can rise up and more and more consumers are expecting that. They want that. They want diversity. We're tired of having the same old, same old. And frankly, I think this other brand they were mentioning is a little stale. I've been eating their ice cream for 30 years. It's ho-hum. I want this kick-ass female chef. So I think that's the right decision. I would just say, speak up. And you know, the only way we're going to get more people at the table is if those of us who are already there are going to start standing up and saying, you need to be at the table. We need to bring other people at the table with us. Thank Sorry. you. I want I to be, a, no, I like that. I want to be a part of your meetings. They sound a <laughs> lot of, like they have a lot of energy. So thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Those guys were all like shrinking. It was a Zoom meeting. <laughs> they were like, okay, Stephanie, we heard you. <laughs> In, in fact, I'm a little afraid right now, to be honest with you. I'm just... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, 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 I know, you know, I told I, my son that story and he's like, mom, come on, we need a break. I'm like, okay, all right. But this, this woman I want to work with is really awesome. <laughs> so, you know, I'll just, I'll, I will tag team uh, off of this. It is being one of those white guys that used to be with a VC <laughs> and, and <laughs> at, that, at that side, I will say that I think that's exactly right. It, it's, it, you know, I, I never looked at anybody, was it male? And again, maybe I'm just, I'm blind to, to that kind of, of differentiation, but it never really mattered to me, black, white, female, male. I want good ideas. And whoever yes. speaks the truth speaks ideas and, and, you know, ideas are still important and implementation is still important and confidence uh, uh, is really important. And you kind of know if someone's confident, if they're willing to speak up and willing to risk failure and, and have that, those ideas. So I would, again, from a completely different perspective, Cecilia, uh, I would echo that exact same thing. It, you know, if you're at the right table, it doesn't matter who you are, what you look like. It doesn't matter any of that. What matters is the good ideas and having the confidence in yourself to say, here's what we should do. Uh, believe in yourself, believe your own truth and, and lead forward with it. So I would agree with that. Um, and not just because I'm afraid of Stephanie right now. <laughs> Thank you. I got like a double answer. That's awesome. Well, and let's see more small businesses as they grow into larger and larger businesses, support other small businesses as they try to do the same. That's really exciting as well. Um, I'm, Anybody have questions? I'm looking for hands before I go to my email. Uh, actually, well, actually, I thought, I'm interested if anyone, you know, what people's thoughts are about, do you think it's easier to innovate with a large firm or with a small startup? Well, I just think that the, the de degree and the extent to which you've had to innovate in a firm of that age really speaks marvels to I mean that was one of the questions that was sent early on and then you said and so now we don't do it that way and we're in 3,000 stores <laughs> yeah 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 I see it is how it's supported yeah I mean when you're small you don't have the financial resources so uh it's harder in some ways to innovate or you know it forces you in many ways it does force you to innovate because you can't just rely on what might be easy uh, because, you know, you can just hire a consultant or hire this technology or, or pay for this technology because you don't have it. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, you, you have know, to Stephanie, do it yourself. Kind of to respond, you know, I, I when I was having companies that I, I started, I would kind of, I would generally have uh, larger competitors. And I was always, initially, I was intimidated. I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, how can I go up against this company that's, you know, I'm a nothing, I'm a little speck, and I'm trying to go up against someone that has, you know, millions and millions of dollars of revenues, and I do not. <laughs> how do I possibly compete? And I found the exact same thing that Stephanie did. Actually, I think it's to your advantage, because oftentimes, 
you know, different industry altogether than, than what Stephanie has, but I found similar thing. They are so entrenched. They've spent years and millions building these complex systems that yes. you can't just change because there's a ripple effect that screws things over. Oftentimes, you know, a, a change will sometimes cannibalize. Companies don't want to do it because they're going to cannibalize. If they do this thing, it might cannibalize their existing core business and they're afraid to do it. So if anything, I like now going up against larger companies uh, as a small as a smaller company because they're in a lot of ways, it's that big ship. You just can't turn that big ship because there's so many other complex systems that are tied to each other that it's a real pain to do a conversion. And companies don't like doing those because it rocks the boat. Uh, it rocks their infrastructure. It rocks their um, you know, uh, uh, how companies do, how way, ways, you know, they've done, they've done things for years and years and years. So, uh, you know, yes, you have the money and, and for any of you that are thinking about, gee, you'd like to maybe work for a small company. I think it's much better to be a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in a big pond, uh, for innovation, for learning, for knowledge, for, for any of that, for what it's, I just kind of tag it on to Stephanie's question. I do think, uh, you know, if you work for a big company there, you can learn a lot. You have a lot of resources. I, I have never worked for a big company unless you count the state of Georgia. So I guess maybe that is, but you can, the city of Atlanta had a ton of resources when I headed up their sustainability office. And actually I got a big grant from the Rockefeller Foundation when I worked for the city of Atlanta in my last year. I was completely funded by Rockefeller. So I've worked really closely with Rockefeller Foundation. So it really is exciting when you work with a company or a foundation at the size of a Rockefeller and you see the magnitude of the infrastructure and the resources that they bring to the table. And, and there is something very appealing and alluring about that. And I certainly got, learned a lot, but um, I think one of the best things I would encourage y'all to do is read, it's a very readable book, uh, Sam Walton's book called Made in America. I actually have read it twice. And you can think what you want about Walmart. I know I have different views, but the book of Sam Walton and how he founded it is, it, I mean, it's a very different company than what he started. But in the book, he actually gives the playbook for how a small company can compete with Walmart. He lays it out, it's in there. He says how a small hardware store can come up against Walmart, so you should read it. He puts it in the book. And he said, if you are a, a small company, you cannot win the volume game against a Walmart or an Amazon. You're just not going to. So don't even try to beat them at pricing. Don't try to beat them at volume. You beat them at differentiating and finding something very unique and special that you can offer that they don't offer, that personal service, that unique branding, that emotional connection. I don't think a lot of people have a warm, fuzzy, emotional connection to Amazon or Walmart. Maybe there are some people out there, but it's not like they get with, say, In-N-Out Burger, which is a brand I love. And In-N-Out Burger is deliberatively small by choice. And that's what's given them that connection. And I would much rather have that emotional connection than just being this huge corporate giant. But of course, Jeff Bezos can afford to fly William Shatner up in space. So there is something nice about that. <laughs> Next time that needs to be the snack in their pocket is a, a, right? a non roll. There you go. All right. Well, I have the honor, I think, of asking the last question of the night, which is I know there's a number of other folks on the call right now who are participating in their own career pivots, and that's part of their going after their MBA right now. And I'm curious what words of wisdom you would have. Um, your pivot has been quite dramatic out of yeah. uh, from environmental law to elected official and then um, civil servant into obviously the family industry is a little distinct, but what feedback, what, what advice would you have for those folks who are following in those footsteps a little bit? Uh, yeah, so I've got some really practical advice and I've got some more big picture advice. I guess the, the big picture advice is to really trust the skills that you've gained along the way. And even if it's a different career or a different type of company you may be working on, 
those essential skills are transferable. So as a trial lawyer, I was advocating for the underdog. I was a public defender. It's about as low as you can get with some of your clients. And I was, I was paid to persuade a jury for some really tough cases. So those skills I use every day arguing for Stuckey's because we're a comeback brand. So that's just one example, but just whatever skills that you have built up along the way, don't think that you can't just trans transfer them because you can. Uh, you can also surround yourself with smart people who can complement those skills. The practical advice I would give, and this was the biggest mistake I made, was, well, it gets to point number one, I didn't trust myself because I thought, well, I've never run a business before, so I need to hire a business consultant. I need to hire a creative consultant. I need to hire this or that. And I had, when I bought the company, I, when I was putting together the financing, I, I put a little cushion in there to hire some consultants. I ran through my consulting money in six months. I burned through it. Consultants will eat up your money. And I'm not saying that there aren't good consultants out there, but I mean, it just killed me. And I look back on that and I'm just like, I can't believe I spent all that money on a business plan that I never use, on a creative guide that I never use, on a marketing plan that I never use. And it was because I didn't trust myself and I felt like, oh, you have to hire consultants. And so I would say, just be judicious with the consultants, trust yourself more. And also there's a lot you can teach yourself. Oh my gosh, I at one point was paying this firm to do Facebook ads for us. And it was such a waste of money. I learned how to do Facebook ads myself, taking some YouTube videos and saved us a ton of money. So you can teach yourself a lot of this stuff and don't feel like, you can't do it just because you've never done it before. If if I can learn how to do Facebook and Google ads at age 50, you know, I'm 55, you can too. Because I'm not like, a, technology isn't always my friend, but you just, you just have to do it. Uh, you have to get outside that comfort zone. And besides, if I didn't do it, no one else was going to do it. So. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Plummer. Absolutely. Stephanie, thank you so very much. A couple things that just as a, as a you know, recap, reflecting on last week and now this week, uh, the, the, the messages, a couple things that uh, there's exact crossover. You, you talked about, you know, some days suck. First, I really appreciate that as an entrepreneur, because oftentimes folks look at, at entrepreneur and think, oh my gosh, it's going to be awesome. You know, it's a, it's a, most days suck. At least that's my experience. <laughs> and, and listening to you, it's most days, it's you're in the grind and there's some problem because the buck stops with you and you have to go and do it. So, you know, that was one thing. And the other piece that you talked about, about along those lines, as you were leading to that was failure and you have to be willing to fail. And, you know, last week they talked, you talked a great deal about um, failure as well. And, and I often say, you know, success is a horrible teacher. Um, failure is what you need to embrace it. You, you know, you need to, because you're, you're going to fail more than you're going to succeed. I don't care who you are, you, you're going to fail more than you succeed, but you just keep going after it. And that was one of the things that, you know, you kept saying, you just got to keep, keep plowing through one day at a time, one day at a time. And, and last week he even talked about um, my favorite saying, my favorite motivational speech of all time from Rocky Balboa, where he talks yes. about, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. That's how winning's done. And I think that's just a great snapshot. And you kind of captured that as well, uh, Stephanie, you, you addressed it. So hopefully. Um, you know, the students recognize it, it's not all success, 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 success each and every day or each and every month. Um, there's a lot of times it's just a brutal uphill, but that's the part that you look back on and say, well, you know, that wasn't so bad. It was hard at the time, but it wasn't so bad. That's the part that gives you the motivation because you left your heart out on the field and you emerged victorious. So that was, uh, that's the part that is fulfilling to you. So, uh, so Stephanie, um, with that, I'm very, very appreciative of your time. Everybody, let's give Stephanie a, a giant applause. Well, thank you for your attention and your good questions. I really appreciate it.
All right, Stephanie, thank you so very much. And by all means, if there's ever anything we can do to possibly help you out, feel free to reach out. We're glad to help. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful evening. All right, Stephanie, we're rooting for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Class, everybody, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening and stay safe. And I will see you next week.